We're continuing our series on the four R's of Bible prophecy, the first one being the rapture, the second one being the resurrection, which happened both together. The third one is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then starting last week, we began to look at the reasons that it's going to be soon. We saw the first reason last week, that is Israel is back in the land. This is, this is paramount in Bible prophecy. The Jews are back in the land. So we're gonna take it up from there today. So be, let's begin by uh, looking to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that to this day you might teach us, feed us, edify us, bless us, and Lord, might you glorify your name in the process. Lord, we pray that as we go, get into the scriptures, that the Holy Spirit might find fertile ground in our hearts to <clears throat> uh, plant the seed and, and water the seed and let it germinate and grow. And Lord, that we might be filled with the word and filled with your spirit. And so Lord, we just pray that uh, each heart here might be right before you to receive God's precious word. In Jesus name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Please open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. We're going to be in this scripture for the whole lesson today, so uh, don't close up your Bible be, uh, you know, part way through, because we're going to be looking at, at some verses there, verse by verse. Luke chapter 21. So we saw the first reason that the coming of the Lord is going to be soon, and that is that Jesus... Uh, had said that the, the, along with the Old Testament prophets, that the Jews were going to come back into their homeland again. Now, God is not in a hurry. And one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. So the Jews came back, established as a nation in 1948. Well, that's getting to be quite a few years, uh, quite a few years ago. And, um, but God is not in a hurry, and we're going to see the pace this morning. We're going to see the pace in which God is uh, adding these signs of the last days, these signs of the end time and signs of his coming. We're going to see this morning how, uh, how that pace is, is moving right along. So we got 1948 as our starting point here. That's, that's quite a few years ago. So... Continuing on, the reasons that it will be soon. And the Bible says that no one knows when the revelation of Jesus Christ is going to take place. I want to share with you six verses from Matthew. Well, five are from Matthew, one from Luke. Six verses <clears throat> that tell us that we cannot possibly know when Jesus is coming back. Matthew 24, 36 but of that day and the hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. All of these verses are talking about the revelation. None of them are talking about the rapture. The rapture has to do with the church. The revelation has to do with Israel. And so these verses are spoken by Jesus to the Jews, to Israel. And so the church is not even in view here at all. So he says, the day and the hour knoweth no man, not even the angels of heaven. Isn't it presumptuous that many people uh, try to set the date for his return? I mean, it's just been multitudes down through history that have picked out a date and said, this is the date that the Lord is coming back. And, and naturally, every one of them has been wrong because even the angels of God don't know that. How presumptuous to think that I, I figured it out when he's coming back again, even his angels don't even know. Secondly, Matthew 24, 42, watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Again, this is talking about the revelation, not the rapture. Verse 44, therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Again, this is the revelation, not the rapture. Number four, verse 50, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and an hour in which he is not aware of. So we don't know when it is going to take place, but we can know if it is soon or not. And this is what we want to focus on again this morning. In the same chapter, Matthew 24, verse 32 and, th and verse 34, Jesus says, learn the parable of the fig tree. Now you need to know that the fig tree is Israel. Throughout the Old Testament, Israel is compared to the fig tree. 
So again, the church is not in view here at all. It's Israel. He says, learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye see these things, know that it is near and even at the door. And in Luke 21, he says pretty much the same thing. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. So the fig tree, the budding of the fig tree is what we are interested in. Now, we cannot know the day or the hour. Jesus makes that quite plain. You cannot know the day or the hour. Those words were spoken by Jesus to the Jews, to Israel. Paul, speaking to the church in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 says, But the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Now we got two different things here. The day and the hour, we can't know. The times and the seasons, speaking to the church, we can know. Well, we're the church. And so we need to be clued in to the times and the seasons. Now, before we go any farther with this, I'd like to just do a little dissecting of those two phrases, times and seasons. The word times means a set time. Something is going to happen, whatever it is, in a set time. That's what, the, what it means. Now, one of the words, one of the Greek words that is used, translated for times, is the word chronos. C-H-R-O-N-O-S. That's the word we get our English word chronology from. Thing, a thing in, uh, that happens in chronological order. Now, the prophetic events, as they unfold, have a, chron a chronology. They have a chronological order. That's why, if you learn the outline of the book of Revelation, which we gave you last week, everything there is in chronological order. And the book of Revelation makes so much sense People get so confused, oh, the book of Revelation is too hard to understand. No, it isn't. There's a lot of difficult stuff in there, but basically it's an easy book to understand because it's all given to us in chronological order. There is the church age. Then that's followed by the rapture. Then that's followed by the tribulation period. Then that's followed by the second coming of Christ. That's followed by the millennium, and that's followed by the new heavens and the new earth. It's, all, it's the chronology, the prophetic chronology of God's program. So this word times here uh, t tells us there's a chronology here in these prophetic events. And then the word seasons also means a set time. Times means a set time, seasons mean a set time, but in the word season there, it means a place of a meeting or an assembly. And there's going to be an assembly. There's going to be a meeting. In fact, there's an old gospel song from many years ago, there's going to be a meeting in the air in the sweet, sweet by and by. That's the rapture of the church. Well, it's the, the uh, um, seasons there carries that thought. It's a meeting place. Everybody's going to be gathered together for a meeting. So what is Paul saying here? He says, there's no need for me to write unto you about the times and the seasons. They were already schooled in the unfolding, the chronology of prophetic events. So he says there's no need to write unto you about that. Now, the times and the seasons is for the church to know. All right, that's written to the church. It is not for Israel to know the times and the seasons. They do not understand anything about the times and the seasons. In Acts 1.6, they, the disciples asked Jesus, Wilt thou at this time uh, return the kingdom to Israel? Okay, Israel, kingdom, earthly reign of Christ. He says, At this time will you return the kingdom to Israel? And this is Jesus' reply. He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. So to Israel, he says, It's not for you to know the times and seasons. To the church, he says, There's no need to tell you about the times and the seasons, because you should know that, okay? So we're gonna be examining the times and the seasons in the course of, this, uh, of these lessons here. But what Jesus did tell uh, the Jews that, uh, at that time 
was about the fig tree. This relates to Israel, the fig tree. And he says, when you see the fig tree bud, he says, you'll know that summer is nigh. And he says, so likewise, when you see these things, what are these things? Signs, prophetic signs. See, God does not give signs to the church. That may surprise you. God does not give signs to the church. He gives signs to Israel. 1 Corinthians 1.22, the Jews require a sign. The rapture of the church is signless and timeless. Nothing has to happen for the rapture to take place first. Nothing has to take place. No event has to happen. No prophecy has to be fulfilled. The rapture could have happened at any time, any point in history because nothing has to be fulfilled. But the revelation, on the other hand, there's a number of things that has to happen before the revelation of Jesus Christ takes place. One, of course, is Israel has to be back in the land as a nation. Well, that sign is already fulfilled. And we, we uh, dealt with that last, last week. They came into the land four times and they lost it three times, you remember? The last time they came back, it, the Bible says, will be the last time they will not lose it again. Okay, that's a sign, that's a prophetic sign. Secondly, the temple has to be built over there in Jerusalem before Jesus comes back again. That hasn't happened, there's no temple there. There's a Dome of the Rock sitting up there on the Temple Mount. Thirdly, the, before Jesus comes back again, the Antichrist has to be revealed. He won't be revealed until the, after the church is raptured, and, uh, uh, but he has, to be, he has to be functioning here on earth because when Jesus comes back, he's going to destroy him. And the Antichrist is going to seek to, to um, uh, prevent the second coming of Christ there. And that's what we call, erroneously refer to as the Battle of Armageddon. So a lot of things have to happen. There's other things also have to happen first. But for the revelation, the return of Christ, the physical bodily return of Christ to the earth, a number of things have to happen first. For the rapture, nothing has to happen first. It can happen at any time, at any place. So all the signs that we read about in Scripture, they're for the Jew. The Jews require a sign, 1 Corinthians 1.22. They, they require a sign, no signs for the church. So when Jesus speaks here about the budding of the fig tree, he says, when you, likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. He says, you're going to know that it is close. You're going to know when it is close. And then um, in, in Matthew 24, 34 there, he says, I say to you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now I want to spend a moment here talking about what is a generation. Jesus said, when you see the fig tree begin to bud, he said, that generation will not pass until all these things be fulfilled. And you know, I learned something this week about the generations. This is a little revelation from God right in the middle of the night. You, you can make a case in the Bible that a generation is for a hundred years. And that comes from Gen Genesis chapter 15 where God's told Abraham, he says, your descendants are gonna go into Egypt. They're gonna be there for four generations. And then the verse, preceding verse says, they're gonna be their slaves for 400 years. So 100 years is a generation. But when the Psalms were written, Psalm 90 says a generation is uh, 70 years, Psalm 90 verse 10. So is, is this a contradiction in the Bible? You know, and I've, I've struggled with this for, one, uh, for some time and trying to figure out which is a generation. Is it 100 years or is it, uh, or is it 70 years? Well, the generation is not a number of years. A generation is the lifespan, whatever that lifespan is at that time. You go back to when the Jews, Israel, were slaves in Egypt. The lifespan then was around 100 years. Joseph died at the age of 110. 
Moses died at the age of 120. Others died, they're always right, right around 100 years. This is, you know, coming from the flood as the years begin to taper off. Before the flood, it was eight, 900 years. After the flood, they begin to taper off down to where it is today, okay? In David's time, and the Psalms were written during David's time, David died at the age of 70, old and stricken in years, the Bible says, and full of days. Okay, so the, for the, the lifespan back then was 70, three score and 10. So a generation back in the days of uh, Moses coming out of Egypt was 100 years. The generation in, by David's time was 70 years. So that throws some light on this. Last week we saw the lifespan of the Jews. Remember that, the little chart? In last week's lesson, the Jews are living today, the average lifespan, average generation, 78 years. Well, if you start with 1948, when the fig tree began to bud, and you add 78 years to that, it brings you up to the year 2026. Now, I'm not saying that's when Jesus is coming back because the day and the hour knoweth no man, but it's something to think about. And the rapture can happen at any time before that time. So the generation is not a number of years necessarily, it is a, a lifespan. Now here's the second reason that the coming of the Lord is, is going to be close after saying all that. Here's the second reason, the first reason, the Jews are back in the land. They've been there since 1948. They are a nation. The second reason is the restoration of Jerusalem. The restoration of Jerusalem. This took place 19 years after the first sign, Israel back in the land, when the fig tree began to bud. 19 years later brings us up to June the 7th, 1967. That's the Six Day War. And in the Six Day War, June the 7th, Israel took the city of Jerusalem. And for the first time in, in I forget how many years, almost 2,000 years, the Jews owned the city of Jerusalem. Now, if you have your Bibles open, Luke chapter 21, notice verse 24. Jesus said, they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. God's prophetic clock began to tick in 1948, and it's taken, it took rather 19 years for the second sign to be completed here. The taking of Jerusalem, Jerusalem under, uh, under the, the control uh, of, of the Jews. Now God said, he would scatter his people. Uh, we had a long lesson on that last week. Uh, just one example, Ezekiel 36, 19, and I scattered them amongst the heathen, and they were dispersed through all the countries. Then he said, I will bring them back. And Ezekiel 36, 24, I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. I just want to repeat something we, we uh, uh, shared with you last week. The first time, they let, uh, the first time they entered into the land that was Abraham and his family, they came from Ur of the Chaldees. The second time they entered into the land, they came as slaves out of Egypt. The third time they entered back into the land was after the Babylonian captivity. The fourth time that they entered back into the land was just what uh, Ezekiel 36, 24 says, all countries, they came back from all countries. So this is talking about here in the last days, all countries. And then look at Ezekiel 36, 28. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. After World War II, uh, the Jews, because of the Holocaust, the Jews began to petition the United Nations for a homeland. And they had a lot of backers behind them petitioning for a homeland for the Jews. And the United Nations didn't want to do it. And at that time, Africa was in a turmoil and there was land available in Africa, unoccupied land, fertile land, good land, much better land than over there in Palestine. 
And the Jews were offered a homeland in Africa. And they wouldn't even talk to, to the UN about it. They said, absolutely not. We have to go back to our homeland where our fathers came from. A land that was bleak and barren and dry and very unpicturesque according to how Mark Twain described it in the middle of the 19th century. So uh, he says, they shall, ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, not Africa or someplace else. It has to be Palestine. All right. Then Ezekiel 37, 21, And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they have gone, gather them on every side. Notice that, on every side. That's out of all the nations they have been driven to. And bring them into their own land. And then Isaiah 11, 11, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand against the second time to recover the remnant of his people. Where is he going to recover them from? All over the whole world, Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And that word islands of the sea means the coasts, talking about the continents. They're going to come from all over the world. Now, right at the center of all of these prophecies is Jerusalem. Jesus says here in verse 24, Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles Will be, will be fulfilled. Now, according to Ezekiel 5.5, 5, Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, is the center of the earth. Notice, thus saith the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. Jerusalem is the center of everything. First of all, it's a geographical center of the earth. Secondly, it's the political center of the earth. The politics going on over Jerusalem is unbelievable. We, every president that we have had, starting with uh, Nixon right on through, has tried to politicize Jerusalem and, and uh, uh, Palestine over there. It's a political center of the world. And uh, very obviously, it's a religious center of the world. You've got three religions headquartered there or not headquartered, but concentrated there. And fourthly, it's a racial center of the world. The natural uh, inhabitants of Jerusalem are brown-skinned individuals. And the farther north you go, the lighter the pigmentation is. Till you get up to Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Iceland, those countries, blonde hair, blue eyes, and so forth. But when then you start coming down, you get to Jerusalem, they're, they're brown skin, keep on going, go south from there. People get darker and darker, their pigmentation gets darker down to black Africa. So right in the very center of the human race is where Jesus came. He died for the sins of all men. <laughs> and you would be surprised if you could see Jesus as he, in his body that he was here 2,000 years ago. He doesn't look like the artist's conception of him with light brown hair and blue eyes and so forth. He was dark-skinned. That's all the people of that area at that time. That, that's, how, that's how they looked. And so uh, it's the, even the racial center of the world. And obviously it is the prophetic center. It is the focal point of Bible prophecy. Now notice in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 2. God says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. And that cup of trembling means a place of fear. A cup of trembling unto all the people round about. Who are the people round about Jerusalem? Obviously, it's Arab people. They're round about. They're, they dwell in Jerusalem. They dwell round about Jerusalem. You have your Palestinians. You have Egypt. You have Jordan. You have Syria. Those are the people round about. And God says to them, Jerusalem is going to be a cup of trembling because they all want to get it back from the Jews. Then in the next verse, Zechariah 12, 3, he says, In that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people, the whole world. And so Jerusalem is, first of all, a local problem. It's a cup of trembling for all people. Uh, uh, people. It's a place of fear and so forth. Um, secondly, it is a 
global problem. It's a burdensome stone for all, uh, for all people. And it says, through all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. That's talking about what we call uh, Armageddon. Uh, they're going, everybody's going to come together at Jerusalem under the auspices of the Antichrist to perform what Hitler didn't quite do. His final solution, eradicate the Jews from the face of the earth. That's going to be the purpose of the Antichrist. And that's when Jesus comes back. That's when the revelation takes place. Zechariah chapter 14, his feet shall stand that day upon the Mount of Olives, and then he's going to go forth to fight for his people. And that's when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and, uh, and of his Christ. All right, five things about Jerusalem. Number one, their sin. It says in Lamentations 1.8, Jerusalem hath grievously sinned, therefore she is removed. Okay, now that happened about 606 B.C. Now, now we're going to see a chronology here. Remember the, the word uh, times there means it's chronology. There's going to be a chronology here. 606 B.C. Because of her sin, Jerusalem was removed. All right, number two, Jerusalem's captivity. Behold, in those days and at that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. That brings us up to the first century and Rome. They became a captive people. Thirdly, we have Jerusalem's God, Zechariah 1.14. God says, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. Why is God jealous for Jerusalem? It's because that is where Jesus' throne is, the th he shall sit on the throne of his father David, that's in Jerusalem. Jerusalem has to be occupied by the Jews, and David, uh, Jesus is going to rule the world, sit on the throne of his father David. Then fourthly, we're going to see Jerusalem restored. Isaiah 62, 7, give him no rest till he establish, until he make Jerusalem a praise in all the earth. That brings us up to the millennium, because that's not going to happen until the millennium. And then Jerusalem's future, Psalm 122.6, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, they shall prosper that love thee. So you have a chronology here. Jerusalem sins, they go into captivity, they are still claimed by God, they're restored, and will go on into the, into the millennium. Now having said all that, let's once again focus on Luke 21.24. Because Jerusalem here is the focal point of all of this. Jesus said, they'll fall by the edge of the sword. They shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until, key word, until, until what? The times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled. Okay, here's a, a quiz about Jerusalem. Did they fall by the edge of the sword? Did that happen? Answer, yes, in 70 AD. Second question, were they taken captive into all nations like Jesus said? Yes, in 70 AD. Thirdly, was Jerusalem under Gentile control then? Answer is yes, after 70 AD. Jerusalem was owned by the Romans, the Turks, the Crusaders, the British, and the Arabs after 70 AD. Before 70 AD, it had, had been owned by the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Syrians, and the, and the Romans. And so the Jews have not had control of Jerusalem for 2,600 years, going all the way back to 606 BC when the Babylonian captivity took place. It has not been their city. They've lived in it, but it has not been their city for the last, well, almost 2,600 years until June the 7th of 1967, they came back and took the city. And that was, this is the second phase of, or second reason why the coming of the Lord is going to be soon. Israel is now a nation. That's number one. Jerusalem belongs to the Jews. That's number two. It took 19 years for those two events to unfold. But God is not in a hurry. All right. Question number four. 
who owns and controls Jerusalem now since June 7, 1967? And the answer, of course, is the Jews. They do. Now in Ezekiel 5.12, notice, he paraph uh, Jesus paraphrased what this verse says. In Ezekiel 5.12, it says, The third part of these shall die with the pestilence and with famine. They, uh, they shall be consumed in the midst of thee. And a third part shall fall by the sword round about thee. And he says, I will scatter a third part of you into all the winds, and I will draw out a sword after them. Well, uh, that's exactly what happened to them. One third died in Jerusalem of famine and disease. One third were killed by the sword. That was under the Roman general Titus. And one third are scattered into all the world. So here we have this. I will scatter a third part into all the winds, and look what it says, I will draw out a sword after them. I'm going to draw out a sword after them. They're going to, be, they're going to lose their land. They're going to be scattered out into all the world. But, but he says a, a sword is going, to, is going to follow them. Okay. Now, has a sword followed the Jews since they've been driven out? You have in Spain the Spanish Inquisition. You have in Russia the pogroms of the Tsars. You have in Europe, in Germany, the Holocaust. And in addition to that, in all the nations, you have ghettos, discriminations, and persecutions. The Jews are required to live in ghettos. They could not uh, work at most jobs. They were forbidden. A sword has followed them down through, down through, the, uh, down through history. So the fifth question there, has a sword followed the Jews? And the answer is Yes, it has. So all of these things are, are, have been fulfilled here. Now there's an interesting phrase in Scripture, and that interesting phrase is signs following. Uh, look in your notes there. Mark 16, 20 says, They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working in them, and confirming the word with signs following. Now, in history, as far as the Jews are, con uh, are concerned, there is a sword following them, uh, Ezekiel 5.12. He says, I will draw out a sword after him. So in history, there's a sword that follows the Jews. Every place they go, persecution, death, so forth. But in prophecy, there are signs following. And notice what that verse says, Mark 16.20, that these signs confirm the word. These signs confirm the word. So when you see, see these signs, it just confirms the truth of Scripture. Not that the Scripture needs confirmation, but God gives these signs to confirm the word of God, telling us that the time is, it, it is late in God's timetable here. Now, five signs follow the retaking of Jerusalem. Five different signs. Let's read verse 24 again. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, that happened, and shall be led away captive into all nations, that happened, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles, that has happened, until, until what? The times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That ended on June the 7th of 1967. They took Jerusalem. Now the, Jesus said, after the take, retaking of Jerusalem, he says, you'll know that this is it by five signs that are going to follow. Five signs. What are they? Here's the first one, verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Out there in space, he says, there's going to be signs. What, what are these signs going to be? There are going to be new things that never happened before June 7th of 1967. What has happened out there in space? Well, we've had moon landings. We've uh, had probes of the planet Mars. We've had probes of the planet Venus. We've got sent out two different probes of the outer planets of, of our solar system, the Apollo series, the, the Voyager series, uh, the Hubble telescope, out there in space, finding new things out in space all the time. I just read the other day, they're getting, getting uh, making plans to launch a bigger telescope than the Hubble. It's going to be launched, put up there in space in a short while. 
In Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, the Bible tells us that in the last days it's going to be a great increase in technology. And we're seeing it, and in space is where a lot of this is playing out. Every bit of these things that is happening in space have all happened since the Jews took Jerusalem. The first man to walk on the moon did it two years and 43 days after the Jews took Jerusalem. And everything that has followed here is after the Jews took Jerusalem. Jesus said there'd be five signs that will take place. Then secondly, it says at the same time that there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. Verse 25 says, upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. He says on the earth, while well, these be signs up there in, in the sky, there will be on the earth distress of nations with perplexity. And that word perplexity means hopelessness. There's going to be insolvable problem on earth. What do you suppose that problem is? It happened after June 7, 1967. And it was the taking of Jerusalem itself. The Jews are there. They own it. They control it. And like the, uh, the prophet Ezekiel said, it has become a burdensome stone and a cup of trembling. You have three religions there in, with, with a presence there in Jerusalem. And those three religions involve a couple of billion people. And each one wants it. Each one is vying for it. The Catholic Church wants it. And uh, Islam wants it. And they've got a presence there. The Catholic Church has a presence there um, in, in Islam. And uh, of course, Judaism, the Jews want it. And, and this involves over two billion people. It's an unsolvable problem. It's hopeless. Jesus said that, it, um, that there would be distress of nations with perplexity. In other words, Man cannot come up with a solution. Well, there is a solution, but it's not going to be found in the courts of the United Nations. It's going to be found at the re personal return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then, sign number three. It says in that same verse, the sea and the waves roaring. You say, what in the world is the sea and the waves roaring? The sea and the waves have been roaring ever since the days of Noah, at least, and probably before that. So how can that be a sign? Now, the way to interpret the Bible is you take as much literally as you possibly can. You don't spiritualize any more than you have to, okay? Take as much literally as you can. Now, this does not make sense, literally. Because the sea and the waves have always been, uh, <laughs> been roaring since there was the sea and the waves. And so what, what do you do then? When it doesn't make sense, when the plain sense of Scripture makes sense, you look for no other sense. But when the plain sense of Scripture makes nonsense, then you have to look for another sense. <laughs> okay? I think, I think that's right. <laughs> so what, 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 hap what do you do then? Well, you let the Bible interpret the Bible. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. Okay, the sea and the waves roaring. What is that? Well, the Bible tells us in the book of Jude. The whole book of Jude, I shouldn't say whole, well, it's a whole book, it's just a small book. But the book of Jude is all about the apostasy of the church in the last days. And in Jude 13, looks how Jude describes the apostasy of the church in the last days. Raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame. It's the church Jesus is talking about here. Well, why didn't he say so? Because the church didn't even exist. He's talking to Israel here. It has nothing to do with the church. So he encodes it here in symbolic language. And he describes it, this, this fourth, um, or this sign here is the fourth sign. Yeah, third sign. He, uh, he codes it here as the raging waves of the sea. It's figurative language. And it describes the condition of the end time apostate Laodicean church. All right. What has happened in the church 
since June the 7th, 1967. First off, this, this one is not in your notes. In 1967, a new movement called the Charismatic Movement, it had begun a little earlier than this, but in 1967, it entered into the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church became part of this charismatic movement. Charismatic movement started amongst Pentecostal churches. It's not Pentecostalism, it's something different. In the charismatic movement, it doesn't matter what you do, what you believe, you can, you can pray to Mary, you can uh, believe in baptismal regeneration, you can believe in salvation by works, you can even be a semi-atheist. All you gotta do is speak in tongues and you're okay with God. That's the charismatic movement, okay? It entered into the Catholic Church in 1967. Another thing that happened since that time, Bible versions started coming off the presses real fast. Every Bible version, English Bible version, before 1967 flopped. Every one of them. There was first the revised version, in 1881, then there was the American Standard in 1901. They both went bankrupt. Then there was some other individual versions that they just flopped like Moffat and Smith and Goodspeed and all that. Nobody paid any attention to them, nothing like that. But in 1967, the very first new Bible version came on the market that Christians accepted and that was the new American Standard version. And since then there has been a plethora of Bible versions, each one worse than the one before it. It's apostasy in the church. And then the music of the world, rock music, is in the church. It's there today. It's in the church. For the first time, the world's music is in the church. Back at the turn of the century, the early 1900s, ragtime music was out there in the world. Ragtime music was regarded as sinful and shameful, even by many uh, people that weren't even Christians. Oh, it's terrible, sinful music. Ragtime music never got into the church. And then a short while after that, in the 1920s, along came jazz and the blues and Dixieland, all of that music, real popular in the world. It's all music of the world. It never came into the church. And then in the 1930s, along came something called swing music. And swing music was popular with the world. We had the big band era. We had Swing and Sway with Sammy Kay, and, and Benny Goodman advertised himself as uh, the king of swing. And, and swing music was a big thing. But nobody ever thought about bringing it into the church. And then in the 1940s, we had boogie woogie music and jitterbug music. And it was big out there in the world. But nobody ever brought it into the church. But in the 1960s, interesting date, 1960s, the late 1960s, rock music, music of the world, and a little bit after that, rap music, which is a misnomer because rap isn't music. It lacks, <laughs> well it does, there's three parts to music. There is, uh, there is melody and harmony and rhythm. Rap is nothing but rhythm, no melody, no harmony. So rap music is a misnomer. But you got rock music and rap music. It's out there in the world. But in the early 1970s, it comes into the church. First time the world's music is in the church. Then you have homosexual churches today. Here's something that didn't happen until the 1980s. Just came across an article. Just recently, the Canadian, up in, in Canada, the Anglican bishop, they got a brand new bishop up there. Uh, the previous uh, bishop's name was Don Harvey, but they got a new guy named Cyrus Pittman. And he sent out a memo to all Anglican churches, all the pastors of all these churches, and he said that they have to, uh, it is going to be mandatory if they come to a meeting at St. John's Cathedral. And at this meeting, he said that anybody even thinking about not allowing homosexual marriages in their churches, he said, resign, get out. And a 
reading here from the text, it says, A new bishop, the right reverend Cyrus Pittman, then had them re repeat their priestly vows. Every one of them, they've been in the ministry for years and years and years. He says, you have to repeat your vows and exacted a loyalty pledge of, of, of them, reissued their licenses as ministers, and it had to be signed by him and not the previous bishop. And anyone that doesn't agree to that, he says, you're out. Homosexuality in the church. And that's going to happen here one of these days, not too far in the future. Then we have a, a new gospel that's been preached since 67, and that's this prosperity gospel, this health, wealth, and all of, all of these things. The, uh, 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 the prosperity, you, uh, you shouldn't ever get sick, and God's going to make you wealthy. And if you're not wealthy and you get sick, you're out of God's will. That, that's basically what, it, what it's talking about. That came along in the 1980s. Then this mega church concept of feel good preaching and, and all that business, uh, book reviews instead of sermons, little chats and, and dialogue rather than the word of God, that came in in the 1990s. And the seeker service concept in churches, totally, totally, completely unscriptural. Romans 3.11 says there is none that seeketh after God. So what's with a seeker service? Jesus said in Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The only seeker is Jesus. Men don't seek God. Jesus seeks sinners. So the, the whole concept of that is backwards. And then Christian show business and entertainers. Uh, churches have become entertainment centers. And uh, the Bible says feed the flock of God, not entertain the flock of God. And we see so much of that today. It's a show business, this atmosphere. That's all come into the church since 1967. Let me give you another one. This one's close to home. A church with over 3,000 people every Sunday that has in their elementary age Sunday school between 40 and 60 children in it out of over 3,000 people. That's apostasy. That is apostasy, and it is upon us. All right, got to move along. Sign number four, verse 26. Men's hearts failing them for fear, looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Heart disease has been and continues to be the number one killer in the world today. And then finally, sign number five. It says, the powers of heaven shall be shaken. That sounds like nuclear warfare. And there's many verses that talk about the end times, what sounds like nuclear weapons. Let's just run through some of these. Jeremiah 50, 46. At the noise of the taking of Babylon, the earth is moved. That doesn't sound like a warfare with bows and arrows and shields and, and spears and so forth. It sounds like... Uh, powerful explosion that can shake the whole earth. Joel chapter 2, verse 30 and 31. He says, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. What's going to be, what is he going to show the earth? Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. That mushroom cloud from the atomic bomb, the pillar of smoke hovering there. It's a sign. And he says, when this happens, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Next word, before. Before what? Before the great and terrible day of the Lord shall come. That's the revelation. Before that day. It's going to happen. It's going to happen during the tribulation period. Second Peter 3.12 Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire will be dissolved and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Sounds like a hydrogen type bomb. Where the fusion, the melting together of the elements. Going to the next page, Isaiah chapter 13. Verse 19 and 20, Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. How did God overthrow Sodom and Gomorrah? Fire out of the sky came down. When the literal ancient city of Babylon fell, it was with conventional weapons, and it happened in the middle of the night, and the, the Medes and Persians just... Uh, entered in through the, the river, the Euphrates River, and captured everybody. It was just like that. 
But end time Babylon, it says here, it's going to be like when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, fire coming down out of the sky and radiation. It says, it shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Sounds like the aftermath of a nuclear uh, war. Then in Jeremiah 51, 26, and they shall not take of thee a stone for a corner, nor a stone for foundations. Why not? Radiation. Zechariah 14, 12, and this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Here's Jerusalem again, center of everything. All the people that have fought against Jerusalem, their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. At eyewitness reports from Hiroshima in 1945, when the atom bomb, which was just a firecracker by comparison to what we have today, when that bomb was dropped, this is exactly what happened here. It was observed to happen. People standing there and the skin just sliding off their body, their eyeballs just consumed in their heads, uh, it, 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 screaming p t terrible pain. Eyewitnesses report, reported all of this happening with just one atom bomb that was dropped. And sounds like there's going to be a lot more than one. So, uh, Jesus is prophesying here about the, the, the signs, and the last one sounds like something that hasn't happened yet, but something we have the technology to achieve today. Who has <coughs> nuclear weapons or is close to develop them, developing them besides the United States? Well, one, of course, is Russia. They've had it for a long time. Russia is an enemy of Israel. Secondly, we have Iran, which the Bible name for Iran is Persia. Persia was the name until 1935. The name was changed from, from Persia to Iran. They are close to having nuclear weapons, and they got a nutcase at the head of their government that won't hesitate to use them, especially against Israel. Um, uh, we read in Ezekiel 38, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, that's Russia, and prophesy against him. And then it lists those that are coming with him. The first one there, Persia, modern day Iran. They're coming in this nuclear holocaust. Thirdly, China. And fourthly, North Korea. Where do they fit in prophetically? Revelation 16, 12, the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. The waters thereof were dried up that the way of the kings, plural, kings of the east might be prepared. K kings from the east with nuclear weapons. We know that they're going to come at the same time Russia invades Israel. It's all going to happen at once, the kings of the east and Russia, because in Daniel 11.44, it says, Tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. They're coming together out of the east and out of the north. So we got Russia, Iran, China, North Korea, and then number five, the European Union, which will be the, apparently be the kingdom of the Antichrist. So these weapons exist now. When they're going to be used, we have no idea. The next verse says, and when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. It says in verse 27, and then. The Jews take Jerusalem, verse 24. Five signs follows the taking of Jerusalem, verse 25 and 26. Verse 27, and then. And, and then they shall see. It's not the rapture, it's the revelation. They shall see. Jesus is real. They shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Signs number one through four have either happened already or are happening. Sign number five is going to happen during the tribulation, tribulation period. The present members of the Atomic Club uh, the United States, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, and the European Union. And how many of those nations are friendly to Israel? Only one. A and that is us. Now the next verse, verse 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Jesus is speaking this to Israel. Not the church, 
Why not the church? The church is not even in view here. The church is gone. Way before uh, the, the, uh, uh, this, this final thing happens here, the church is going to be gone. The church will be raptured out of here. So Jesus is telling the Jews here, when these things begin to happen, the budding of the fig tree, the buds, the blossoms, the leaves, the, the uh, branches, all on the fig tree, they're all growing. And as we said, God is in no hurry. Sign number one, the Jews came back to the land in 48. Sign number two, they took Jerusalem 19 years apart. And when is the next, one, uh, next sign going to take place? Well, uh, that's in the hands of God. The day and the hour knoweth no man. So that brings us to the, uh, to the end of today's lesson, the taking of Jerusalem. Very important prophetic event that happened in the lifetime of most of us here. Now next week we're going to look at a, another prophetic sign. And this one does not have to do with, necessarily have to do with Israel. We're going to see another instance of the last days. Okay, let's look to God in prayer. And if you need the back lessons, they're laying right up here. Lessons uh, one through four. This is number five today. Heavenly Father, thank you now for meeting us here. Lord, quicken our spirits heighten our understanding, give to us discerning spirit, Lord, to feed upon and digest your precious word. And Lord, we pray now that, Lord, even as the, we see these things and we see on your time clock where, where we're living, we've, we've seen signs that have happened, signs that are happening, and, and signs that still are yet to happen. Lord, we know that our, our redemption draweth nigh. So may we be living in expectancy of Jesus coming for us at any time. Dismiss us with your blessing in his name. Amen. Amen.